Well, welcome everyone to the final day of Pride. Um, and I'm so happy that we could be having this very, very important conversation um, where faith leaders and community leaders are coming together to show their support for the Equality Act, a very, very important piece of legislation that would give important uh, legal protections to LGBTQ plus people across the country. Uh, a piece of uh, legislation that President Biden um, has consistently touted as one of his top legislative priorities um, in, in which he wants to see on his desk so that he can sign it into law um, Im immediately. So we have a wonderful collection of, of leaders here today to talk about why the Equality Act matters for LGBTQ plus people. I can't think of a better way to end Pride Month by talking about uh, a really important um, um, uh, measure that will take uh, the LGBTQ plus community to the next level as, as, uh, with regards to um, our struggle for full equality. So without further ado, I am thrilled to be joined um, by the Secretary of Transportation, uh, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who will get us kicked off here. Well, thank you uh, so much, Reggie. It's uh, great to be with you. Great to be here with Assistant Secretary Dr. Levine and all of the distinguished faith leaders who, who are joining us. Uh, and I want to wish everybody a, a happy Pride, uh, a season that is uh, among many other things about community. And so to be with uh, a community uh, of leaders, of allies, and of LGBTQ uh, plus people together uh, on this final day of the month is, uh, is fitting and inspiring. I'm very proud to be part of this Biden-Harris administration because this is an administration that believes in representation and that works to build a more decent and more equal America every day. And it strikes me that in America's story, the moments that make us proudest of this country are so often the moments in which this country widened the circle of who was considered worthy of the rights and the protections that are enshrined in our founding documents. And it also strikes me uh, that uh, in this country, uh, one that is uh, uh, built among other things on uh, freedom uh, of religion, where we who are in public service are called on to serve people of every faith and of no faith equally. Uh, it is yet uh, often the faith community that has pushed this country to widen that circle, uh, to recognize the dignity of every person. Often the faith community that provided uh, morally powerful reminders that we are all created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And it, it is uh, clearly the case that so many of our values are rooted in moral traditions that are also linked to traditions of faith, including our values around lifting up the poor, around welcoming the stranger, around protecting uh, the sick and the vulnerable. Uh, all of the, the uh, experiences that, that I have had in, in service and beyond have uh, shown me how faith can also be an engine of human rights. That was certainly the case in uh, my own church and congregation back home the place where uh, I celebrated my marriage to Chaston, a marriage that uh, I believe has moved me closer to God. Uh, so when I look around this virtual table and I see so many different faith traditions represented, it's, it's a powerful thing for me to see. Um, now, we know that that circle of belonging is not as wide as it could or should be. Uh, I say that as somebody who has had many advantages, uh, but also uh, grew up seeing how being LGBTQ plus was something that could cost you your job, could cost you your life in this country. Uh, and at many points in my career, um, military and uh, civilian, uh, faced some very real choices between being my whole self, finding love, and serving my country and my community. Uh, and just in, in my short time, we've made such amazing gains that, among other things, made it possible for me to be uh, the mayor of my Indiana hometown, an officer in the U.S. Navy, um, and now the first Senate-confirmed openly gay cabinet secretary sworn in with my husband standing right next to me. And this is an administration that is better, not just with regard to inclusion, but with regard to our mission, uh, because of the contributions of the extraordinary out public servants who are here, including uh, Assistant Secretary and Dr. Levine, who, who will be speaking shortly. Um, we know that we've got a long way to go. Uh, and especially at a moment where LGBTQ plus youth are being targeted, uh, sometimes by their own state leadership, uh, often still regularly facing discrimination, 
uh, as LGBTQ plus often uh, people are, often are in employment, housing, education, so many of the facets of life that, that others are able to take for granted. That's why the Equality Act is so important. It will extend the civil rights protections that have been uh, the law of the land for a long time to now cover uh, sexual orientation and gender identity too, so that uh, there is clear, consistent federal protection. And it's good policy. It extends basic protections that are already afforded to other Americans. It strengthens anti-discrimination protections for everyone. Uh, it benefits women and communities of color and, and makes our entire country stronger as we have always become when we have moved more in the direction uh, of uh, seeing people based on their merits and, and based on uh, who they are. I often think about how future generations are gonna look at us. They're gonna look at anybody who had a position of responsibility or trust here in the, these pivotal early 2020s. And it strikes me that we can do the right thing uh, so that future generations can live in a better America and can look back with pride on the steps that we're taking in this time when we have been blessed with the influence that we have, whether it's as policymakers, faith leaders, or others in positions of responsibility and trust. So thank you to everyone here for the work that you do, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation to follow. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. And one important um, uh, item that the Secretary mentioned about how the Equality Act will extend protections to millions of Americans, you can go to the White House website, uh, whitehouse.gov, there's a fact sheet um, there uh, that details some of the ways in which the Equality Act will uh, strengthen protections, not only for our community, um, um, but for Americans across the country. And, and with that, we'd love to move to our uh, next special guest, um, the Assistant Secretary for Health at the United States Health and Human Services, Dr. Rachel Levine, who, who uh, in addition to Secretary Buttigieg, was a history maker um, as the first transgender person to stand for Senate confirmation and be confirmed. Um, Assistant Secretary Levine, take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Reggie. And thank you, Secretary Buttigieg. It is certainly a pleasure to join you all today. Um, as Reggie and the Secretary said, I'm speaking to you today as the Assistant Secretary for Health. And it was certainly the honor of my life to be nominated by President Biden and to be confirmed by the United States Senate with a bipartisan vote. And I do recognize the importance of, of serving in this role and, and the significance of serving as a, as a visible representation for transgender individuals, especially for transgender youth who are being targeted, as the secretary said, by, by many regressive you know, laws in, in a number of different states. You know, the Biden administration is really all about standing up for all Americans, respecting the digni dignity of each person and bringing the American people together. And so we gather here today um, for, for hope, for a more inclusive future uh, with the Equality Act. Um, LGBTQ plus communities have, have come a long way but we still have a long road ahead uh, and raising awareness is, is such an important step. And I hope to, 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 to bring awareness in my role as the Assistant Secretary for Health. But we need to work uh, across our administration, across all the agencies, but also with, with very important um, faith leaders as yourself to turn awareness into action. We have not truly made progress unless we've all made progress. And we need to continue to strongly advocate for the most vulnerable in our country and the most vulnerable LGBTQ individuals. Um, as we've mentioned, that includes LGBTQ plus youth, particularly trans youth in, 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 in at this time, um, LGBTQ plus seniors, um, LGBTQ plus immigrants, and particularly LGBTQ plus individuals of color, such as trans women of color, who are not only at risk of of harassment or discrimination, but actually at significant risk of, of violence and murder. Um, the, the Equality Act is so important. You know, um, I, I come from Pennsylvania, uh, which is actually the only state in the Northeast which does not have comprehensive non-discrimination legislation that would include LGBTQ plus individuals. So, you know, after our eight years, uh, in the administration, um, then I could go back to Pennsylvania and they would say, thank you, you know, Dr. Levine for your service and the opioid crisis and COVID-19. 
uh, but we will not sell you this house and we will not rent you this apartment uh, because you're a transgender individual. And that would be legal in most places of Pennsylvania, not in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, which have their own local laws, but in most places of Pennsylvania, that would be true. And in too many places in the country, that would be true. So, you know, we, we need to change that and we need to change that across our nation. And the vehicle to change that is the Equality Act. Um, COVID-19 has shown us like nothing else that we are all in this together, that we are all interconnected and we have to work past the differences that tend to keep us apart. Um, there is a place for everyone in America. Um, our quote unquote more perfect union includes LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, and I'm a positive and I'm an optimistic person. And I, I think the future is looking like a brighter, more inclusive place. And we will get there with your help. Um, my only final comment, um, given uh, uh, the issues of the day is about COVID-19. Please, um, please, uh, it is so important for people to get our safe and effective vaccinations, especially in light of the, uh, of the new Delta variant. Um, so please, for yourselves, for your families, uh, for your uh, communities, uh, and for our nation, and really for our world, uh, please get vaccinated and encourage our, others to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Levine. We appreciate you and appreciate uh, Secretary Buttigieg just being here today. Um, and with that, we'd love to now introduce some faith leaders who can talk about why the Equality Act is important to you, and they um, have uh, they want to share just a, a minute of, or so of remarks um, each to uh, uh, really sort of explain why it is that we all ought to go out there and do our best to advocate for this really, really important piece of legislation. And first, I would like to start with the Reverend Dr. Paula Williams, pastor, uh, the Left Hand Community Church in Longmont, Colorado, an author of As a Woman. Paula? It's so good to be with you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I'm really concerned with what I see happening in the states around the United States, particularly as it relates to transgender children who are so vulnerable. And I see that we need now more than ever before to make sure we guarantee transgender rights at a national level. That's why I'm so supportive of the Equality Act. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Dr. Paula Williams. And next, we have Reverend Naomi Washington Lephart, uh, Director of the Faith-Based and Interfaith Affairs of the City of Philadelphia. Thanks, Reggie, and thanks, everyone. I'm so delighted to be with you. Today is my wedding anniversary. For four years, my wife and I have journeyed through life together. For 48 months, we have weathered the storms of low bank account balances and major surgeries and a global pandemic. For 1,460 days, we have gotten on each other's nerves and made each other laugh. For 35,040 hours, we have dug out of deep snow, literally and figuratively, negotiated contracts and raised a family together. And you know the best anniversary gift we could ever receive? The ability to relax. We don't want something else to do. We don't need another place to go. We want the conditions to be right so that we can just be. No pressures, no deadlines, no distractions, no tension. We just want to rest. I want to be clear that it's not just our busy schedules that keep us and many LGBTQ plus folks like us from the rest we need and deserve. For many LGBTQ plus people, rest deprivation is our status quo. Because you can't relax when you're not sure if your pride, your affirmation of self, your bold visibility, your decision to love and be loved out loud and in public actually makes you a target of discrimination. You can't relax when saying yes to yourself means that the housing office might say no, or the hotel might say no, or the employer might say no. You can't relax 
when your safety is precarious and your peace of mind is fleeting, when danger and disenfranchisement stalk you daily. Here's what I know. Rest is every human being's birthright. We all need and deserve the chance to let our guard down and celebrate. And I'm reminded that rest is a mandate of my faith tradition as well. In Jesus' first sermon, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and ultimately proclaim the year of Jubilee, a special time, a sabbatical year when all forms of indebtedness were interrupted, when people could take a break from the toil of labor, when peace that passes all understanding was available. And as long as our current laws don't fully protect LGBTQ plus people from discrimination and the harm that discrimination causes, we are deprived of all that is possible when we can just rest and be ourselves without having to worry again or cry again or fight again. This is the last thing I'll say. While rest is a human birthright, it unfortunately is not inevitable. Our ability to rest is a direct result of the amount of power and resources we have. Rest needs the right conditions and the Equality Act would create those conditions for queer and trans and non-binary folk to rest. It would add the concrete layer of protection that we so urgently need. So as a black queer Christian minister, I support the Equality Act because so many of us are exhausted trying to find our place, our dignity, our respect. We need rest. So we need policymakers to help create the conditions to make that possible. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Washington Lephart. And next, I would like to introduce Imam Abdullah and Tepley, Associate Professor of the Practice of Interfaith Relations and Associate Professor of the Practice at, at, at Sanford Uni uh, School of Public Policy at Duke University. Thank you very much, Reggie. Salaamu Alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a distinct pleasure and honor to be here on this noble event. Um, throughout the human history, people who see the religion as the truth, unevolving, unchangeable truth, reveal the worst of religion and worst of humanity. Whereas those who see the religion and faith as seeking the truth, looking for truth, constantly evolving and understanding God's wisdom behind his creation, has revealed the best of religion and best of humanity. When religion changes its mind on any given issue, that doesn't mean it's proven wrong or it's, uh, it's at fault. That means they learned more. And this is an innately religious act. And the fact that many, almost, not almost, every single major religion's majority in the United States are supporting LGBTQ equality. And a majority of every religion in the United States including my own proudly, American Muslim communities are supporting federal protection, laws against discrimination of our LGBTQ siblings. Very often, unfortunately, in these kind of conversation, religious bigotry, voices of exclusion in the name of religion, overpowers and silences this incredible thing happened in the last few decades in America. My prayer and question uh, to Secretary Buttigieg and Assistant Secretary Levine is, how can we make sure there's a success story here? That will be the main story. The religion and religious communities for the better change their mind because now they learn more, they know more, they experience God's relationship with God's children more. So how can we make sure that will be the main story, not just loud voices of exclusion? And the secondly, as many people said in their own words, this Equality Act, not only essential, it's a moral taint the level of discrimination that our LGBTQ siblings are going through. But it will not only help them, it will expand the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So nobody is doing LGBTQ plus siblings any favor. Not only we are acting in our moral imperatives, moral requirements, but also we are helping to ourselves. Every community, including religious communities, especially religious minorities, will have more civil rights, more freedom, more accommodation as a result of Equality Act. So I cannot imagine anybody with a moral functioning conscious and faith and connection to God in this day and, night, day and age and light will be against Equality Act. I hope many will join like me, my wife and many allies do. And lastly, 
Pride Mubarak, everyone. Thank you so much, Imam. And I know that you posted a few questions for our special guest, Secretary Buttigieg, and Assistant Secretary Levine will have a moment here in a second uh, just for a few questions. Um, uh, but I would love to now introduce the Reverend Dr. Delman Coates, Senior Pastor at Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland. Thank, thank you so much, Reggie, and good afternoon to all of you. It is an incredible honor and privilege uh, to be with you today among so many esteemed colleagues, certainly with Assistant Secretary Levine. It's a pleasure. Secretary Buttigieg, it's a pleasure as well. My best friend in the world, Lil Mel McMorris, served as co-chair of your campaign, sir, and it's just an honor. Uh, it, the, the Equality Act is so important to me because 10 years ago, as a local pastor in the Black church, I learned, I became intimately aware of the way in which LGB, LGBTQ plus members of my church did not have equal status as it relates to health care and employment in our community here in Maryland. It became critically important to me as a faith leader to stand unapologetically and unashamedly beside them as a pastor in the black church tradition. A tradition that I understand as being historically connected with the fight for freedom, justice, and equality. And if all of us are not free, then none of us are free. And I am intimately aware of the way in which Faith leaders in my own tradition have not been have been um, have not been vocally supportive of the LGBTQ plus community. It's important to me to change that narrative and being uh, an, uh, an advocate, a supporter, to fight for freedom and justice and equality. I'm so thrilled uh, uh, that uh, for the Freedom Act and. I don't know if this is the appropriate forum to raise a question, Reggie, but my one question for our panelists is whether the Fulton v. Philadelphia case presents any concerns toward, um, you know, our, our, our panelists or is anyone concerned about the Fulton v. Philadelphia case in, you know, in our fight to provide equality for our LGBTQ plus citizens? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Dr. Delman Coates. And I, I pose again to our uh, special guest if any comments you have when we get to the um, question and answers uh, portion, please feel free to chime in there. Um, but we'd love to um, introduce now Josh Scott, the lead pastor at Grace Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you. Hello and happy Pride. It is uh, such an honor to be with you all today. Uh, my faith tradition teaches me that God creates all human beings in the divine image and that every single human being enters the world with inherent value and inherent belonging. Um, but the truth is, throughout human history, we as a species have not always recognized that equality. And for far too long, our LGBTQ plus siblings have borne the injustice of inequity and the protections against discrimination have not been extended to them in explicit or consistent ways. And that's why I'm supporting the Equality Act, because it will help us uh, as a society take a step forward, an important step forward on this journey of becoming a, a country, a society, a place in which all of God's children have the equality that is rightfully theirs. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce Bishop Yvette Blunder, the presiding bishop, the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. Thank you so very, very much. It is my joy to be here in this august body of friends and colleagues. Uh, I am a woman of faith. I am black and I am same gender loving. And I am here in support of the Equality Act. And I thank you very, very much, Secretary Levine and also uh, Secretary Buttigieg. For all of these realities in me to live together, they must make room for each other. LGBTQI people are our family members, our medical providers, our church members, artists, neighbors, athletes, and pastors, religious leaders. Now, I say to my friends often, you don't have to have the experiences of same gender loving, transgender, gender nonconforming citizens 
in order to support our rights and our equality. Much like white people, good friends of mine that I know who put their bodies in the way to march with Black Lives Matter and to march with Dr. King. I'm grateful for the men who put on pink hats to march with women for women's rights. And to my beloved faith leaders and colleagues, faith can and do and must do much better to shift the negative responses to what we fear. We have got to stop bringing God into the fray as though God is an enemy of the people that God has created. We did not do well with chattel slavery or with kindness and generosity and in so many ways, the rights of indigenous people. We did not do well with women's rights or interracial marriage or now voting rights as people of faith. What is our fear? What is it that gives us terror such that we would make God an enemy to God's own creation? So I wanna leave you with this. Let's not just talk love and justice this time. Let's lead this time. I have the wonderful opportunity to be married for 37 years to the voice of Oh Happy Day. She is the lead vocalist and she sung, sung this song for almost 50 years. What can I say to you? I would like to call this time when we vote the Equality Act into law, the Oh Happy Day Day. In, in recognition of what we can do as faith leaders to bring the kingdom of God and good to earth as it is in heaven. God bless you is my prayer. Thank you, Bishop Blunder. And, and last but not least, I uh, would love to represent, uh, to uh, introduce rather, Rabbi Rachel Coburn, the spiritual leader at Congregation Rodeb Shal uh, Shalom in Denver, Colorado. Thank you so much. It's really such a joy and pleasure to be here today. So last year, when one of my teen congregants came out, he chanted a celebratory blessing at the Torah on Shabbat. In that moment, I reminded him that we are his people, here to cheer him on in times that are celebratory, here to support him in times that are challenging, and here to love him for who he is. As a rabbi, I work to create a community that is safe, inclusive, and supportive of all of my congregants, a community that celebrates who they love and their gender identity. While safe and inclusive communities are great, they're wonderful, we actually need much more than this. We need a safe and inclusive society where we don't have to fear that our kids will experience discrimination in education, in the workforce, when buying a house, or when walking down the street. I am supporting the Equality Act because it's what we need for a better, more just America. And because my congregants shouldn't have to worry about discrimination when their kids come out of the closet. They should simply be able to say, Mazel Tov, and I love you. What powerful uh, comments and reflections uh, from each and every one of you. And I um, thank you so much for your presence. I want to underscore, you know, again, why we're here today and how and, and just how important this convening uh, is. Uh, as someone who grew up Baptist, uh, uh, evangelical, and now an Episcopalian, knowing that members of the faith community, all of our faith communities have important platforms to use um, uh, in, in service to each other. Um, um, this White House, this president is wanting to make sure that that platform is available and there. So your presence here today um, gets, us, uh, gets us down that journey and we hope that you will, will use that, your platform. Uh, more, also, in addition to that, in a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Congressman Cedric Richmond, who leads the Office of Public Engagement, uh, Jane Klein, who leads the Gender Policy Council, um, and Ambassador Susan Rice, um, who leads the Domestic Policy Council, held a roundtable with Equality Act coalition leaders to see how we can um, work together to get this important piece of legislation to the, the, the president's desk. And of course, we are at, in OPE working hand in hand with our, our faith leaders, um, uh, Josh Dixon and Melissa Rogers and all of our colleagues who do faith-based outreach to ensure that 
all of our voices are brought into uh, this conversation. So with that said, I wanna, I know that a few of our uh, guests that you just heard from have questions for Secretary Buttigieg and for Assistant Secretary Levine. I wanna start off with Josh Scott uh, to pose a question. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Secretary. Um, how can faith communities and faith leaders, how can we best leverage whatever influence we have uh, to support the passage of the Equality Act? Thank you, Josh, and, and thanks to all of the uh, leaders here for uh, your incredibly compelling perspective and, and words and, and leadership. Uh, and I'm mindful as a, uh, as a uh, government official and not a religious figure that it's not my place to advise, let alone instruct on matters of conscience or matters of strategy. Uh, but what I would do is, is remind you of the power of the communities that you've built and the, the trust that you were building as you sustain communities of people who look to one another for support, uh, for moral and, and personal support. And that platform is very important. Uh, it's an important way to make sure people are conscious of the uh, the worldly environment they're in, where not a lot of people even know that discrimination is still legal in 2021 in the United States of America, uh, and may also not quite know their own power in doing something about that. Uh, and that uh, uh, basic level of, of understanding in one local community at a time uh, can have enormous implications. One thing I've noticed uh, working across the aisle in my few months so far in Washington is the one thing everybody uh, uh, around here has in common who is elected is that they're all from somewhere. And when the people where they're from raise their voices on matters of conscience, it can have enormous influence and in, in power, often much more than uh, uh, somebody uh, like me uh, going around saying what we think ought to happen. So I think that that ability to inform people of what is happening and to remind people of their own power uh, uh, as citizens um, but also uh, as these questions of conscience uh, require certain things of us, uh, I think is extraordinary and, and never to be underestimated. Thank you so much, Secretary Buttigieg. And I know Imam and Tepley had a question as well. I already asked mine, but I will only add, um, what would be the strategy to inform, better inform the religious and faith communities? As Secretary Buttigieg said, not many people know that like naked discrimination is a law in some places. Our assistant secretaries could go back home and couldn't rent a home uh, and house. What are some of your outreach strategies to the faith communities? And in that, how the religious leadership here and beyond can have you of help? I know uh, uh, my colleagues may be able to uh, speak to this as well, but, but to me, it's, it's so important to uh, be able to reach out to different communities of faith that are organized according to principles of, of belief, but also uh, moral principles and, and principles of support for one another. Um, and again, so much of it is just information, uh, as, uh, uh, just as good health information uh, and health services have uh, not to wander out of my lane and into Assistant Secretary Levine's, but it's been uh, so important to engage faith communities in, in that regard, as I know she and her colleagues at, uh, at HHS have, have been doing. Uh, you know, I often think about the, the, the uh, relationships between the world that we live and move in and, and my own faith tradition that, that teaches so much about uh, the responsibility to serve others and to lift uh, one another up and to see the dignity and humanity in everybody. And, and that, that teaches me that love is, is the greatest thing that we have to offer. Um, and when we look at, at the Equality Act, uh, we see this extraordinary opportunity to enshrine values that I don't think are partisan values uh, or need to be uh, regarded as values from any one segment of our society, but are actually on a direct through line from the best uh, of the founding traditions of this country. Um, so uh, uh, in, in that regard, we want to do everything we can to provide good information um, and to uh, continue to uh, keep up that consciousness of, of the extraordinary moral authority uh, and uh, organizing ability that faith communities have in uh, touching people in the name of compassion, uh, where uh, perhaps uh, uh, political boundaries can break down uh, and a, a shared vision of how to make life more gentle in this world. Uh, as Aeschylus uh, channeled through RFK put it, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that that would make us all better off. You know, I, I agree completely with the, with the secretary. 
Um, one aspect, and I agree um, with one of, the, one of the speakers that talked about fear. I, I think that people um, fear what they don't understand, what might be beyond their experience. Um, and I think that issues of, of sexual orientation, but particularly gender identity are beyond some people's experience. And so they fear that, and, and then that can lead to um, uh, that, that can lead to anger and hate and, and to, to discrimination. So, you know, as, a, as a, a visible out transgender woman, what I hope is that people will see me um, I'm advocating uh, uh, for public health, uh, advocating for COVID-19 vaccinations, advocating to battle the opioid crisis and many other different issues. Um, and it, uh, it shows that transgender individuals are like anyone else. Um, uh, we are physicians, uh, we are public servants, uh, we're teachers, we're, uh, we, we work, we're, we're everywhere. And so that there's no re reason to fear us and it can become um, really part of their experience. And then that can lead to more um, tolerance, acceptance, and more towards welcoming diversity. As we say, inshallah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those, those reflections. And I know we have one more question from the Reverend Dr. Naomi Washington Leppard. Thank you so much. Um, I, I am thinking about uh, what I would call a narrative concern that I have about pushing the Equality Act over this hump. What I mean by that is, you know, I'm a black queer woman and I understand that the Equality Act would deepen and broaden protections, not just for queer folks, but for black folks and for women. We know that the Civil Rights Act excluded women uh, initially. And so tell us how we can strategize so that more people know that more folks than queer folks stand to benefit. And I don't even like to put us in those kinds of silos, right? Black people are queer and queer people are women and, and on all of that. But I think that there's been a perception that perhaps only white cis gay men for example, stand to benefit from the passage of the Equality Act. So could you advise us a little bit about how we can broaden the narrative? Well, thank you so much for, for that question. Uh, I, I think that that is a very important point. You know, uh, I, I think it is so important to celebrate diversity in all of its different aspects and the wonderful tapestry uh, that we have in the United States. Um, and, and not just to create an accepting environment, but a welcoming and celebratory environment. You know, the, the fact is, and I mentioned COVID-19, is that the pandemic has impacted some communities far more than others. Uh, COVID-19 has underscored the profound health disparities in this country that really have plagued our nation for, for too long. Um, you know, our mission at the Department of Health uh, and Human Services is to enhance the health and well-being of all Americans. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we need um, the Equality Act and we need to understand the Equality Act that it would protect everyone, not just specific LGBTQ community members. Um, as you point out, the LGBTQ plus community is not a homogeneous group. Uh, we are older and we're younger, um, black, white, uh, Latinx. We live in urban communities. We live in suburban communities. We live in rural communities. We all have our special, unique characteristics uh, that make our community our our, our community so wonderful. Um, so we must all work together. We must all work collectively. We are all interconnected. A healthier future certainly includes eliminating health disparities and promoting health equity for everyone. And so we're asking everyone help to do that. Uh, and so we want the Equality Act to encourage people to stand up for all Americans, respect the dig dignity of all Americans and bring the, uh, the, the American people together. And I know that that's what our president wants to do. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Levine. I know Secretary Buttigieg uh, has to leave us and I really appreciate everybody for just sticking uh, uh, in here with us. I know we're going over a little bit, but we're really thrilled to have you. And, and thank you, Secretary Buttigieg, um, for being here with us. Thank you so very much. Honored to be with you. Thanks so much for your leadership and your work. Thank you, sir. And I know we're coming to the end of our program and, and I certainly want to give um, uh, Secretary Levine in, um, the opportunity to provide any closing reflections. 
Um, and, and, and take it away, Dr. Levine. Thank you so much. This was just great. This was, this was a, a wonderful webinar talking about such important issues, bringing together faith leaders a, 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 across, a, across all, many, many faiths um, to, to talk about fairness, to talk about equity, to talk about inclusiveness, and to talk about equality. Uh, what could be better than that? So it really has been an honor to participate and to meet you all. Um, and so we will all work together towards passage of the Equality Act um, so that uh, we, we can see equality for everyone in America. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And thank you everyone for joining us. Just, I wanna underscore one more time just how important it is to President Biden that we work together to get the Equality Act to this desk so he can sign um, this really important piece of legislation um, into the law. Um, as we end Pride Month, I am so honored to be joined by so many incredible leaders and I hope you're all giving a virtual round of applause right now. Uh, uh, just their incredible voices and their mentorship and their guidance uh, continues to, to sustain us um, in our country in so many ways. And I know you do as well. So I want to thank you for being um, uh, you know, exemplary leaders in your communities um, as well. Tonight, the White House is hosting a convening on transgender equality um, on uh, the White House's YouTube channel, 7 o'clock p.m. I hope you will tune in. Um, and I hope you, you will continue these conversations in your own communities. Um, and thank you again for joining us and happy Pride. <laughs>